Okay, um, so as uh, Kavi said, I've been working in this area for uh, too many years. Started uh, with uh, very simple academic problems like scheduling problems and some of you seem to have been exposed to this already. So, uh, I'll be very careful in what I say. Um, and then went on to look at the problem of how do you have system support built around the scheduling algorithms and you'll see why that is required and what I mean by system support in the course of the lecture. Then we saw that there was not enough processing and architectural work to support these systems, buses and connection protocols and all that. Then we found there were no, not enough tools to support these architectural systems for real time purposes, went into tools. So, I looked at the whole end to end uh, spectrum of issues in the real time area. And here we have a nice robotics lab where we have put in some of those uh, learnings to work in a slightly different context from what I had been doing before. So, you will probably see a fair amount of uh, examples from the um, experience that we have gathered over the years. So, here is a question for you. Uh, which of these would you consider as a real time event? All of these involve time, correct? The quiz is a real time event because it is at 7 o'clock. So, is sunset. Sunset today is at 6.42 actually. That is a real time event. What if you do not get there at 6.30? That is arrival time which is a real time event. What if you get there at 6.45? You missed it. What is the consequence of that? Nothing. The world will go on. Sun will rise tomorrow. You just missed a beautiful opportunity. So, the quality of what you get from your visit to IIT is decreased somewhat from that single missing of a deadline, but nothing catastrophic happens, right? Unless you are a, a sort of a, an outdoors lover and you think that your whole ex experience is zero because you have missed the sunset, which is possible, but not likely. Um, similarly, for the entertainment program. So, none of these are what we would call as what? What kind of real time? all of them are soft in some sense. Some of them are soft, some of them are not quite soft. Some of them have a real deadline. The sensor is at 642. If you go there at 645, it is not there. If you go to the quiz at, at 705, you can still participate in the quiz, right? It is not quite soft in the sense of the sunset, but it is still soft. So, can we characterize these differences between various types of real time? not simply for the purpose of theoretical analysis, but also from system support, scheduling and those kinds of points of view. That is what we will do today. Let us take a, a look at the examples that Kavi introduced to you before. Uh, which of these has real time components? They are all embedded in some sense, they have embedded components in them, but which of them have real time embedded components? Submarine does because there are lots of sensors which are being processed. The car of course, has real time components. Even the car, if you look at it, car has some critical real time components such as braking, the uh, automatic uh, cruise control, things like that. Also non embedded, non real time, but embedded components like the ones that are used to move the window up and down the ones that control the uh, the entertainment component of the car, things like that. So, we have embedded, we have real time, we have real time embedded. Not everything that is embedded needs to be real time, not everything that is real time needs to be embedded, right. For example, if you look at the uh, jet aircraft, it has a very small embedded computer, but the real time part of it is very, very important. The, the number of cycles you have to do per second is very tightly controlled, otherwise the aircraft's control will be unstable. Whereas, uh, if you look at um, the submarine, it has got both embedded and real time, some are real time, some are in embedded, but not both. So, there is a com combination of these things, right. So, in this two day sequence, you will see examples of both kinds of 
combinations, non real time embedded, embedded, uh, non embedded real time, and you can imagine the other combinations. Okay. So, the question then is what is real time? So, if you think of the term real time, what are the key phrases that come to mind? So, what are the key phrases that come to you? You play this game, right? I, get, I give you a word, you tell me what comes to your mind immediately. That's, that sort of game is what we are playing now. When I say real time, what are the key phrases that come to mind? Time. Predictability, time, time. deadline. deadline. Performance, latency. Latency, time. latency time or response time, priorities. priorities. So, everything we have considered so far are requirements, priorities is a sort of a, uh, an artifact which is embedded inside the system and how do you assign priorities is the question, right. Uh, any other? Reliability, robustness, control. Fast, nobody mentioned fast, but fast is a relative term and that is what we will see now. So, for a long time and even today if you ask many people, um, what they are doing they uh, for example, when they are browsing the network, the internet. and ask them what kind of activity they are involved in, they would characterize that as real time activity because it is got interaction between humans and computer, right. There is a certain sense in which it is real time uh, in the sense that the faster it is the better the responsive response of the user will be to the internet and back and forth. So, what we will do is to ask the question is fast good enough and from the kinds of responses that we got from you, uh, I think you already sold on the idea that fast is not good enough. For example, I will just go through these uh, so look at, like a cartoon. The moment the environment changes, what is the environment here for the, for the mouse? It is uncontrolled, it is not constrained, it can just take its own sweet time to push the cheese out. What will be a constrained environment for this? If the cheese is kept inside the mouse trap and there is a certain time that the mouse trap takes to close the door, the, if the mouse knows about it, it can quickly go in and come out. If it does not know about it, it will take it could take its own sweet time to bring the cheese out. So, knowledge of the environment is very critical for real time purposes. You cannot say it worked today well in this environment. So, it can be expected to work well in the other environment also, that is where things go wrong usually. The software is sort of, sort of taken from one box and put in another, not realizing that the boxes are very different, the things surrounding that software component is very different, the kinds of signals you get from the outside are very different, ok. That is where most of the systems go wrong when they use reuse components. So, we have a fly here, what is the for what is the real time constraint for a fly? it were to escape, is there somebody with a fly swatter? If that is there, you have to know how fast somebody can swat the fly. So, you have to know about again characteristics of the environment. So, this is what this is, the mouse trap, fly swatter. What you have is that the environment typically cannot be slowed down. You have to work with what is there and design the system accordingly. So, that is the real world, ok. So, going back to the slide that I skipped, uh, we have a computer world that we all use with PC based or laptop based whatever, uh, where the response time from the user is based on the interactivity. Uh, if it takes longer, you get annoyed. For example, in the case of interactions with the internet, studies have shown that about 8 seconds worth of delays can be tolerated by most humans because that is the time that you need to think about what to do with what is going to come to you. Beyond that you start to drop off. So, there is something called stickiness of websites for example. You stick to a website if the response of, this of the website to you is about 8 seconds. Otherwise, you give a different URL and go on. 
So, sites are very conscious about this. This is not hard real time, it has consequences for missing that deadline of 8 seconds. Not to you, you may find the same camera in another uh, web store, but for the company it is a consequence and if many of them happen in a row then it is going to lose some more of his revenues. So, all of this is computer time and the important thing to realize here is that the computer controls the speed of the user, it is not in your hands. Whereas, here the examples are industrial systems, airplanes and you have seen the pictures before, events occur in the environment at their own speed, you have no control over them, if the reaction is too slow deadlines will be missed, the reaction can be damage, loss of human life and sometimes simply quality of of uh, service is reduced, your experiences of a low quality. So, as opposed to user following the computer speed, here we have the computer following the user speed, user meaning the environment. Okay. Okay. So, here is a caricature of what a normal uh, real time system looks like. We have sensors which produce data or events. So, event could have some data attached to it, right? Speed of a car, um, temperature of a room, things like that. So, that is the data, and the computer system absorbs it, consumes it and perform some action. So, for example, you are sitting in this hall here, there are sensors all around, temperature sensor all around, it is not quite the case here, let us assume, which measures the temperature and if the temperature goes above 35 or 30 let us say, kicks in the ACs, turns them on and observes the temperature continuously, if it goes below 28 it stops them and so on, so that is basically what we are talking about. And in general, it could be distributed. Sensors could be all around the, the room, or be aggregated. If the average goes below some threshold, then the ACs will be stopped. If the average goes above, it will be on, turned on. So, you have a range which is comfortable, that is what is being controlled. And um, if, this, if the ACs take an hour to turn on, or the control system take an hour to decide, clearly our comfort level will go down. So, that is why these actions have to be taken in a predefined time interval. Here it is not consequential, catastrophically cons consequential, but in general it could be. For example, in applying brakes, if you take your own free time, you can imagine what is going to happen. So, I want to take you through a very specific real world example. Hopefully, you can see the, yeah, it is quite clear there also. Uh, this is a, what is called as an aircraft flight simulator before pilots are allowed to fly, they have to log about 200 hours of their time on these flight simulators. So, these have to be as uh, high fidelity as possible, meaning that they should mimic the exact reactions of the aircraft and the environment in which the aircraft will fly. And so, quite a bit of uh, care is taken to make sure that even the simulators react the same way as a flight would. So, here is uh, what is happening. There are three parts to this, one is the user or pilot end that is this box, it has got lots of these components. Uh, this part is the um, simulator which is part of the server, simulator in, turks, in turn talks to something called hardware in the loop, the wings, the spoilers and the, uh, the, the tanks for the fuel, everything that will control the quality, the, the, the stability of the aircraft which have to be controlled by positioning the aircraft's altitude, uh, slope of travel, whole navigation system, right. So, what are the time constraints here? Time constraints have to be given in terms of responses to pilot inputs and pilot input is based on what? Perception of the state of the aircraft. If the pilot wants to go to 10,000 meters or 10,000 feet high, height, then the pilot should be told what the current height is. The pilot is told is 9000 feet, there is one more thousand to maneuver. 
if the pilot is told is 9000 but the actual height is 9500 they will have a mistake in the control. So, there is obviously a need to sample the aircraft state and give the correct state to the user. So, can you sort of uh, guess what these numbers might be and where they are required? First of all, the joystick is sort of a caricature for all the uh, different types of control. Okay, so, your input comes through something like a joystick uh, through a port. It is read by the uh, pilot or the, the client written to the network to be fed to the server. The server maintains the flight dynamics meaning the, the current state of the aircraft and all that which comes in turn from input from the actual position of the aircraft the various hardware in the loop components which are on this side. So, this is where the loop completes as far as the hardware is concerned. This is where the loop completes as far as the input is concerned. It will change the current position and other parameters. So, both of these contribute to the flight dynamics state computation. So, this has to be this loop has to be done every so often ok that is one very periodic activity. And here the input might come be fed into this and come back here. Uh, there are two types of timing constraints I mentioned one here in the context of the flight dynamics in addition to that there are two from the client's point of view. One is how soon can a pilot give a second input compared to the first input. For example, all of you have done double clicking on the mouse right. If the second click is not immediate after the first click it would not be construed as a double click. So, there is a time constraint there you probably did not realize that in an explicit way. The device driver knows that the second click is within a delta of the first click. So, considers that to be one event since that is the operating system. Similarly here when should two inputs from the pilot be viewed as two inputs and not one input. And as it turns out these timing constraints are all specified by the by an international organization uh, based in Montreal. So, there they have specified these time constraints so that anybody can build a simulator and if you go from simulator for of company X to Y you can still fly the aircraft same aircraft. And these are also the same software that run on the flights themselves. So, everything is standardized. So, I will come to the numbers um, this will give you an idea this is 18 milliseconds. Uh, in terms of saying that if two inputs come within 18 milliseconds the second input can be discarded. The pilot is simply over anxious. The second is that in the, in the olden days you know what used to happen when you send a stock market buy command through the internet or if you go to a website to buy a book and you say yes I am willing to pay for the book people waited for a while if the response did not come back they will press again they will have two books at the doorstep. Now, there is a warning saying until the window is changed do not press this button again. In fact, a lot of people have lost money on the stock market by selling or buying too many times all of these cautionary things have happened over the years just by experience. Same thing here also here it can have even more catastrophic consequences right. So, the second type of constraint is how long does it take for the system to respond to a user's input and that depends on the path that is taken for the input to go be made available to the flight dynamics box and the feedback coming back to the pilot through an AV module saying the input has been recognized. That whole path is about 150 milliseconds that is a constraint specified by the standardization committee and it is 200 milliseconds for commercial aircraft 150 for fighter aircrafts. I will come to that these numbers again. So, this is a kind of uh, embedded real time system for sure right? this is called avionics and the avionics is the most difficult component of the software on a flight there are lots of others. Uh, for example, which control the lights from the 
the overhead lights, for reading lights, the entertainment system, they are not obviously as stringent or critical as these are. So, these are compartmentalized in the case of an aircraft. There are separate processors which are run in replicated mode for these and not for the others. Okay, let us take a more mundane non real time example of what is seemingly non real time and see where time constraints come from. In the previous case time constraints are given by somebody. Okay. This, is, this is often what happens, we as software engineers have to pay the price of some control engineer sitting in some, some other room having decided for us. So, it is important to know some, some control theory also unfortunately we do not have time in this two day sequence to do that in our regular course which is semester long we have at least a few lectures on control theory. So, as to give us some confidence in being able to talk back to the control engineer saying look you may have some leeway in your decision making can you pass it to us and why would you do that? You may be given more work than you can handle. So, in that case you can say I cannot do this, but if you change these numbers from x y z to x prime y prime z prime maybe I can when you try it. Okay. So, that is where this comes in and this is sort of a very simple example you have a lot of plastic solid plastic poured into this container here and heated through this coil when this con contactor is turned is you know presses this point here through which power power is supplied into this uh, coil heats up this thing you know the usual method of heating and um, you measure the temperature through this sensor here and when the plastic is molten uh, melted sufficiently and uh, it can be poured through this uh, funnel into the injector and uh, there is a plunger that can be pushed forward or back in the current position it can only be pushed forward. Move the mold, molten plastic into the form into like a mold to form a chair or a whatever you want whatever this is uh, designed for and remove the form the formed uh, plastic thing uh, know that the, the form is empty the whole process starts again. So, we have to keep the plastic at a proper temperature why if we heat it up too, too much by keeping the pow power through the coil for too long it will start to have bad properties it might blow up it might start to to produce fumes who knows what right. If it, if it is kept in a low temperature for too long it will start to solidify the time it takes to bring it back into molten state will be that much larger and because it is a cyclic process where you cool down sufficiently heat it up sufficiently we have to make sure that the temperature ranges that the system allows the container to be in is within a acceptable interval. Similarly, for this when you say go forward it cannot be just going forward 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 all the way here it will bang into this and that will cause some consequences also. So, we that is why we have these stoppers which and this is spring here. So, as, as soon as the stopper hits the point B it will be de detected and the forward signal will be turned off and the spring allows it some amount of time to go forward still. So, now how long can you go forward? the length of the spring determines that. After you detect that the stopper has reached the point B you have this much amount of distance that can be covered minus the, the contracted uh, length of the spring and if from the speed of the plunger you know how long it will take. So, from that you can determine how much time you have in terms of response time. So, similarly for the plastic also depending on the nature of the uh, chemistry or the properties of the heating and cooling we can determine how long it has we will come to that a little later. So, all of these um, imply that we have a computer control system typically and it is got properties which are above and beyond the normal properties. What are the normal properties of interest in when you write a piece of software it has to be safe. 
safe says nothing bad will happen. Of course, that's not enough, right? I have to make something good happen. That's called liveness property. And something good will happen tomorrow is not may not be good enough for us. Something good, good should happen within a time constraint. That is where timeliness comes in. And this is where deadlines, periodicity, start time constraints, interval constraints, all of that comes in. For example, our um, the, the rescheduled events of the day have all of these examples, periodicity, the sun rises and sets periodically. We have a start time constraint for the quiz, 7 o'clock. <clears throat> we have an end time constraint for the PAF, the entertainment program, 10 o'clock. Why? Because there is a curfew. Lot speakers can't be turned on beyond 10 o'clock. We have an interval constraint also. What was that to you? So we have different types of constraints. So we mentioned the term performance and I asked you um, what are the keywords that come to mind. So response time was one. Nobody mentioned throughput, but typically when we have a system designed, like an operating system, we talk about throughput response time as the main performance criteria. Here we want to also achieve timeliness. There's no point in having a deadline of 6 o'clock today and finishing that work by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? So more precisely, can we predict that the deadlines will be met or time constraints will be met? The predictability was also mentioned during our chat earlier. Now, in some cases, predictability will cost you something. What is that something? If I have to predict that I will finish my work by 5 o'clock, I need to plan my activities. Planning takes time. To plan my activities, I need to know how much time I have to allocate. So I have to understand my application also that much better. I have to make sure the resources required for my activity will be there. That takes some time. As opposed to just starting the work as many of us do, especially when things are urgent, and hope and pray that things will happen by deadline and the right resources will be available at the time we need them and so on. So predictability is important, but predictability does not come for free. We have to design the system in a way that predictability will be achieved or can be achieved. Predictability is not always required. Where it is not required, there is no point in paying the price of predictability. Right? So, for example, um, if I am going to meet a friend and he is an understanding friend and he is at the airport and he, when we decide that we will meet there at 6 o'clock. Now, from here to the airport can take between 15 minutes to one and a half hours. If I am meeting him at 6 o'clock, I could leave even as late as 5.30 and if I am lucky and he is lucky, we will meet there at 6 o'clock. And if I am late, it is okay, he is still going to wait in a restaurant and it is alright. If I am taking a flight on the other hand, especially at a, an hour when the traffic is unpredictable, I better leave at the worst case start time, give, giving myself an hour and a half. So if, I'm, if I do not need that predictability, as in the case of meeting a friend, there is no point paying the price for it. If, I, if the consequence of not being there on time is high, I should be doing something in a predictable way. So which means that we have time constraints, they have a lot of colors attached to them, a lot of flavors to them. We have to deal with them in different ways, depending on a lot of things coming together. So that leads us to the idea of types of real time systems. So when somebody says I work on real time, ask them what kind of real time and what are the different uh, dimensions along which you can characterize this what kind, how tight are the deadlines. Deadlines are tight when something called laxity uh, which is deadline minus computation time, computation time being the activity execution time you know, is small. So if you have tight deadline, we have to be very careful in how we spend the remaining time. 
So, this lacks the word lacks comes from being free being flexible. The flexibility being less means that we should not take any other activity which might come in the way of meeting these deadlines ok. So, laxity is one of the components um, laxity by itself does not characterize everything the other one is how strict are the deadlines I think by this time you would have uh, sort of gotten the drift of that strictness is very important characteristic the deadlines are strict meaning that if I miss them there is a consequence or there is a catastrophic uh, outcome if the deadlines are, met, are not being met then it is very strict. We need to characterize some of these more formally we will do that in a second. The last one is very important also from what I said at the beginning in terms of the fly swatter and the uh, mouse trap and all that what are the characteristics of the environment will suppose there is a mouse an intelligent mouse in a lab and is observing the mouse trap its characteristics based on what other mice have been caught right and it decides that it is going to catch the get the cheese out and not get caught by going in and out very quickly. But if it does not realize that the mouse trap gets changed every day it is going to be you know having a bad deal. So, observing the environment is one thing realizing from that the environment is changeable is another thing. So, you have to put the resources required to do this observation also which is why logging is done typically. Why do you log you want to see how the system evolves over time has anything changed has the characteristic of the system changed over a period of time. So, you, you can start a design with a certain assumption, but those assumptions have to be validated at the time of flying and you should have built into the system the backup plan plan B if you will. So, that if the consequences of the changes are substantial you can go to a plan B this is what makes the whole system robust. If you have a single very simple system it works only in you know condition which which has x y and z com combining together it is a very brittle system brittle meaning it will fall apart if something changes. Um, however, you will notice that because systems are built with the worst case assumptions as the design criterion even brittle systems work for the most part. The only consequence or price you pay is a very large processor where a small processor might have done well enough or a system which has to go back to the drawing board whenever there is a small change ok. So, understand all of this tightness strictness dynamics. So, in in spite in independent of how these three three things come together designers want this system to be fast predictable reliable flexible. Flexibility in terms of being able to add more things reliable you know, you know fast you know predictability are covered. So, I am going to introduce three words three terms three uh, key ideas all of which are going to be used to formalize the notion of strictness ok. And to do this what we will do is to have a value time diagram as this graph indicates. So, as time progresses what will be the value that you get ok. So, let us assume that um, for a moment ignore this minus plus lines there is a time called the deadline at which we want to finish something all right. So, how would the hard real time look hard real time will have a certain value or critical safety critical is the same uh, me has the same meaning before the deadline there is a value and the value could be here here depending on what the actual value is and after the deadline at the deadline it comes to 0 and stays go to goes to a very large negative value. Now, this is basically telling the designer that you better not miss the deadline even if one deadline is missed it means you are adding a very large negative value to all the other values and so overall consequence is that the value given by the system upon the missing of one critical deadline is very large negative value ok. Soft how do you think it will be something like that 
there is a value to meeting the deadline. You get a slightly higher value before the deadline. So this might be a good example, a, a good example of this, this might be doing the browser interaction. Eight seconds is what I mentioned before. But before that, if it, if it comes back, you're very happy. After that, you start to drop off in your in interest. And after a while, you basically give up. Because you've gone on to another site. Right? Now, we need to be somewhat uh, more precise about a third kind, uh, uh, another kind of soft real time, which leads us to the third kind of um, task or activity, where the value drops to zero at a deadline. So, now these values are uh, dependent on the activity. Now, also, um, we may have a combination of deadlines and start times. These are called deadline intervals. So this is the example of this was sunset that we saw earlier. The finishing should be, the activity should be done within, between a start time and an end time. Otherwise, the, it has no value. Another uh, dimension of this which uh, is important to realize is that whose value are we talking about? Let's take uh, an example of, uh, of a final exam, right? For JE, Joint Entrance Exam for IIT, for example, the exam starts at 9 o'clock. Nobody is allowed to go into the hall after 9. And if you have spent your last five years of school going through coaching classes, four coaching classes, four coaching classes for JE, and you go to the exam hall nine, at 9.15, what is the value to you? Very large negative value. It's catastrophic. People are known to do this, right? Sleep late and then get up late on the day, miss the whole exam, you feel shattered. It's a critical task for you. Well, how about the IIT system? What is the loss for the IIT system of this one guy going late? Nothing. There are 4 million people of, of some very large number of people taking the exams. So one guy missing it is not very, going to be any con having any large consequence. So the value is dependent on the perspective. Okay? What we are talking about here is value to the system. The system is what everybody sees. The task is what you see as the invoker of the task. The system should make sure that the, the tasks that it picks up for execution have the largest value to the system and the users of the system. Okay? So remember this, the semantics and the perspective that has to go into this. Okay. Um, can you think of a firm real-time example? An example of a firm real-time activity? Firm is one where after the deadline it has no value to anyone. So typically in multimedia, what happens is that a sequence of frames are being processed by some frame processor, let's say. And if you take your sweet time to process a frame, the next subsequent frames will be delayed also. So there will be, there'll be a cascading effect of one deadline miss over the others. So what's usually done is to drop a frame, go on to the next one. And us humans can easily you know, fill the gap in a sequence of, let's say, movie, movie frames or whatever. So it's okay to do that. So that's a firm real-time application. Okay. Similarly, you've seen probably these uh, um, conveyor belts when you when you get off an aircraft and you're checking your luggage, right? And you're sitting next to, and you're just walking in from the aircraft, and you see your luggage going through. Sometimes you run and pick up the luggage before the thing is gone. Otherwise, what do you do? You wait. You wait for it to come back again. That's an example of, again, a firm real-time application because you have to pick it up. If you miss that deadline, nothing wrong will happen. There's a chance for the bag to be picked up again afterwards. So this is a good example to take because in firm application, firm real-time applications, typically the case is that one miss will not lead to a consequence. Two misses may not lead to a consequence. Multiple misses together will lead to a consequence. Okay, suppose um, 
in the case of uh, in the case of uh, conveyor belt you have to pick up the luggage before the luggage leaves the the conveyor belt rather moves around to a point where luggage is not visible anymore because it goes back through the in a holding area the loading area rather and comes back again so there's a certain amount of time given to you to pick up the luggage if you miss that deadline you miss the firm deadline because there's a certain value to picking up the luggage before it comes back again because you had to wait for a little longer so the value is how soon can you pick it up after the deadline is zero value but the point i was making importantly was that this task will be re-executable or can be tried again the next time the luggage the that part of the conveyor belt which has your luggage comes back in front of you if you miss that time again because you're talking to somebody else and were distracted it'll come back again so the point is there's a certain value to getting the luggage off the conveyor belt the value will keep dropping in some sense as time progresses because you're standing there doing nothing but after the deadline you have to wait for another task execution to happen to try this again with a smaller value soft example is what i mentioned before the browsing of the web if you get an immediate response you get a large value you feel happy about it you can do other things not simply wait for the browser to come back you give a url you know it takes its time to bring the page in front of you the sooner that happens the faster the next interaction can be from your side uh, and like i said the uh, studies have shown that 8 seconds to be a good time by which to try to get the page back to the user after that studies show that the dropping off rate is very very large slope is very high okay so you all get the idea the ba- the main takeaway from this slide is that real time systems come in lots of different colors shapes sizes flavors and there's no point in saying that i am working on this real time application and so i can also work on this other ap- application the the kinds of requirements you need to understand each one of them could be very different the platform used for soft real time cannot be used unless it's properly tailored for hard real time application and vice versa okay so uh, this is too broad based but um i'm going to introduce some terms very quickly i've already used them a task is nothing but a running program a service being performed some function being executed it requires some resources this is very important to understand resources not only cpu time which is called execution time but also some other resources like buffers sensor values network uh, time and so on so typically what happens is a sensor is here in some part of the car the actuator is here in some other part of the car for example if you if you sense that uh, within 1 meter of the car there is a, another vehicle some obstacle that is being sensed by lots of sensors they are all physically distributed across the different the periphery of the car the actuator will brake or accelerate depending on what the decision of the control system is that is sitting here the sensors are all around control system is inside the the brakes are at, at the at the wheels so typically you have a physically naturally distributed real time application that you normally see which means that any activity which has a an interval of time within which it has to execute from the time you sense that there is an obstacle or a car near you to the time you have to react to it might be bounded this is not a single monolithic task a sensing task control task activated task all of that has to happen within the deadline so for this to happen i need to have the sensing processor have time on its end the control task having control processor having time at at its end and the braking processor having time at its end and the communication path be available so it's an end to end provisioning of the resources and not simply one cpu requiring a certain amount of time unfortunately we won't have time here to talk about how this time is going to be divided but you'll get a feel for it as you go on okay is that clear so that sort of gives us a good introduction to real time systems hopefully even those of you who are working on real time see the the different dimensions in a slightly uh, broader perspective 
than you've been used to. So, let us quickly go through the real time constraints. Um, how do we express these constraints? Um, you know, we can say this is a deadline, this is a start time, and so on. Predictability simply is the idea that the system is temporarily feasible, meaning that functional feasibility is easy, system can provide the, the functionality required. You just check the code, see if it for this given input produces the right output. <coughs> Will it produce the right output by or within the time constraints? The answer is yes, you call that system to be feasible temporarily with respect to that task and this time constraint. Um, as I mentioned before, time constraints <coughs> as far as uh, many of us are concerned might come out of thin air, somebody gives it to you and says do this, but they do not. So, whenever that thought comes to your mind, look at the or remember that plastic example as a starting point. The constraints come from the nature of the environment in which something is working. So, what usually happens is you identify the events, derive the model and then finally specify the time constraints using the control law and so forth. By the way, I mentioned the term control law, what I am saying actually is the following. <coughs> If I do not understand the environment fully, then I cannot control it properly. That is a st statement which is easy to verify, right. So, the question is how often should I check the environment? So, suppose uh, here is a uh, simple example. Suppose I have to keep the pilot up to date with a maximum discrepancy of 1 kilometer per hour. How often should I sample the speed of the aircraft? Think about it. Suppose the maximum speed is 500 kilometers per hour. From that, I can determine how long it will take for the aircraft to fly 1 kilometer. At least at that rate, I should sample. Because if I sample now, the next sample will come a period later. That distance covered in that duration of two sample arrivals should not be more than 1 kilometer. You see that? So, that is where the environment comes in. The environment here is the speed of the aircraft, the aircraft itself and the speed with which it flies. <coughs> but there is something subtler than that, that uh, has to be understood. Um, for example, suppose my period is defined like this. So, what I am saying is, you sample the, the velocity of the aircraft, here send the output but before the end of that period. This is a periodic activity. Within that period you sample and also finish the actuation whatever is required to, to respond to the sample value. Now, it is quite possible that in this period I do the task here. I am somehow lucky enough to finish the work at the beginning of the period. Unfortunately, if I am unlucky in the next period to finish it here, what is the maximum spread between the finish times of two consec consecutive instances? Twice the period. Assume that the execution time is 0. From the time I put out one actuator command to the next time I put out another actuator command this that distance of in terms of time would be two, two times the period. Okay. So, in that duration I do not want these the environment to have changed more than 1 kilometer per hour. So, which is why usually sampling is done at twice the required rate. So, I should now see how long the it takes for the aircraft to fly in the worst case half a kilometer to provide us an accuracy of 1 kilometer. There is another way of deriving this coming from Nyqu Nyquist criterion which some of you may relate to also. Okay. So, that is what I mean by derivation modeling of the dynamics and then specifying the time constraints. The only way then if you do not have a fast enough processor to sample this at the required rate is to say 
that the aircraft fly at a slower speed which is obviously the wrong decision to make. The other way is the better way is to say that I will provide the aircraft with a faster processor right ok. So, um, periodic means activities occur repeatedly and this is often the, the normal mode of operation things arrive finish work next sample comes and so on. This is not to say that there are no, there are no other dimensions or semantics of periodic tasks in radar processing for example, samples come at us at a very high rate of high frequency ok which means small periods and typically what you do is to aggregate these radar signals over several stages. The first stage samples looks at every sample coming in creates a track, the second stage aggregates the tracks of multiple observed the phenomena flights and things which are being observed in the sky for example, by the radar. And the third one produces an alarm. So, there is a fairly large sequence of pipe pipeline activities each stage produces outputs. If you look at the last bit of alarm generation that is also based on these periodic inputs, but its period is much larger than the actual incoming sensory input period. So, things get complicated as we go into real systems, uh, but typically period means within that period you get the input and produce the output also. So, if you think of alarms, alarms can occur at any time, there is no arrival pattern. So, you should be looking at aperiodic tasks slightly more carefully. Because if an aperiodic task like an alarm or a breaking event is a hard real time alarm you have to be ready for its arrival any time. You cannot say after the alarm comes I will see if I can do it, if I cannot do it I will say sorry right does not work cannot work that way. So, what do you do the next best thing is to look at it as a periodic activity which has some aperiodic characteristics. These are called sporadic activities, they have the aperiodic uh, activity semantics like they can arrive at any time. However, once an alarm comes the next alarm would not happen for some amount of time called the minimum inter arrival time. So, which means that you can in a way in a very simplistic way assume that the periodicity of this sporadic task is this minimum inter arrival time you do not have to be prepared at every second along the way you need to be prepared once an alarm comes for another alarm which is min m i n t minimum inter arrival time away is that clear. So, our aircraft simulator that we talked about before the minimum inter arrival time is 18 milliseconds which is what the specification is which says that if the pilot gives another input within that interval it can be discarded by design by definition. So, the question then is who initiates these actions periodic or aperiodic and uh, there are uh, two broad types of possibilities and things in between and these are um, an an analogs of what we do in normal real normal non real time systems also. These are called polling driven interrupts versus polling polling driven device processing versus interrupt driven de device processing. You poll you ask the question is there another character from the keyboard is there another character from the keyboard periodically you go and ask do you have something to do versus devices like disks which are interrupt driven when the work is done they send an interrupt until that time you do not have to worry about if the device has something to give you. So, same thing happens here also except that in our case they call event driven for the uh, interrupt driven activity interrupt being the event arrival which triggers the system to look at it as a as a new arrival uh, to be converted into a task for processing. The other is called time driven or time triggered which is the polling based approach because the polling itself is driven by time 
So, that is basically the difference. So, event driven or event triggered is similar to interrupt driven activity and time driven or time triggered is called normally as polling driven activity. So, which is better? So, here is a our reactor and you would like to keep the temperature at most here after that the reactor will blow up this is a plastic container being heated up as time progresses as the coil is being as electricity goes to the coil it will get heated up. And um, what you would like to do is not reach here and then say oh let us turn the power off it's too late because it takes a certain inertia for the system to react. So, you, you want to be prepared for it. So, you want to set up another threshold above which if the temperature goes you want to immediately stop the power from going through the coil. And how much should this time be? This is the time for the system to react right. So, if you know something about the characteristics of the coil and the reaction time for recognizing that this temperature has been reached you can then come up with this time again environment driving the time constraints. So, here you are this is the profile of the temperature change as time progresses you are heating now. So, temperature rises you come to this point you want to turn off the heater this is an event you respond to it in an event driven system you will respond when that event happens. In a time driven system what you do is you periodically wake up and ask the question what is the current temperature that is these circles. So, here you wake up ask the question what is the temperature temperature is below the threshold nothing is done goes back to sleep. Another event another uh, timer interrupt goes off at the beginning of the next period you ask the question what is the time what is the temperature at this time temperature is above threshold. So, you turn off the heater now. So, the heater turn off happens here in the case of an event driven system in the case of a time driven system it happens slightly later ok. And then afterwards you in the case of a time driven system you wake up again ask the question what is the temperature it says I am below threshold nothing happened nothing needs to be done. So, question now is what should be this period. So, it depends on how long it takes for the system to go from for, for the reactor to go from here to here. Well, what is the worst case scenario? This event this signal this trigger happens just about here at this point. If it happens there when the next period occurs it will be from here to there right that is the period. So, the time that it takes for the system to come back and ask the question what is the current temperature will be here next. If in that interval if the temperature is likely to go beyond that then you have lost it. So, what we have to do is ask the question what is the profile of this temperature uh, increase in such a way that having just missed having just sensed temp sense having just sensed temperature which is, which is below threshold what is the worst case increase in temperature in a certain duration and make sure that you will sample it again soon enough that that high temperature point is not reached again environment driving the periodicity constraint definition ok. So, which is better time driven or event driven see usually what happens is um, the answer which is it depends is the right answer, but uh, one has to be looking at the other factors because finally, at the end of the day you have to design a system which way will you go is the question. And to answer this question you have to ask when this event happens are there other events that are possible. For example, in one of the worst um, electrical grid power failure in Australia in the late 90s 1200 events happened at the same time they all had one origin a trip event led to failure cascading from one part of the system to another 
and they had not planned on some, so many arrivals at the same time. So, the whole grid came to a halt and subsequent to that in, in the state of New York and the US similar sort of thing happened. There is so much of interaction between one grid, one power grid and another in different states that led to most of the eastern coast of, of the US coming to a blackout state. So, event driven systems, so people who work on event driven systems were criticized for having not thought about this worst case scenario. Now, the question is can a time driven system plan this, could I plan this better and it depends. If the time driven system for, uh, did not pick up the right kind of event to deal with for example, in this case because one event was responsible for all the others if that had been dealt with first all the others would have been discarded. But you what usually happens is the following you are doing something very urgent somebody knocks on the door you have to spend some time saying come in or go away. By the doing that somebody else knocks on the door. So, that is a cascading of just interrupt not processing, but recognizing this itself takes time and because in systems interrupt handling is given the highest priority just the recognition the recognition itself takes time and with 1300 interrupts coming in on a as a barrage you can imagine the consequence of that. So, design is very important if you have a if the software design is not correct and the underlying algorithms are not correct whether you do time driven or event driven does not matter ok. So, with that I am going to just give you um, another scenario where time driven works rather poorly. So, the, the moral of the story is that one of these is not always better than the other if you choose one design the rest of the system according to that and it is also possible to marry the two. You have some aperiodic activities, some periodic activities chosen correctly. So, the one um, sort of thumb rule I would like you to take away from this is that make all the time critical safety critical tasks as periodic or sporadic as the case may be because there you have you can give a guarantee you can execute the tasks in a very predictable fashion even if anything else happens their execution will be guaranteed. Things which are soft and firm go away to event to even uh, driven design. So, periodic will ensure that and, and of course, on top of that periodic activity should have a higher deadline I mean higher uh, criticalness or importance compared to aperiodic. Let me repeat this now make sure your periodic activities have a higher criticalness or importance as they are dealt with by the system. You mentioned priority in the case of systems that is the, the number the priority number assigned to safety critical activities should be made higher than other activities ok and they can be designed to be time time triggered. Things which are not time critical like firm and soft you can have them either periodic or aperiodic but the important thing is their priority as the system recognizes should be smaller. This is not easy to get I will I'll tell you why when we come to the scheduling algorithms uh, this design requires some amount of tailoring customizing the priority levels in a systematic way. So, um, TT can be viewed as periodic triggering ET is aperiodic triggering you can marry the two not for the same event but for different events you convert the aperiodic events into sporadic. So, that they are held handled in a way hard real time activities are ok. So, uh, the reason people prefer time triggered is because the stable number of invocations you know precisely how many interrupts will come because you know they are going to come at this in a regular interval. Event triggered are invoked only when needed of course, the problem is that when you have a high number of invocations the computation demands on the change dynamically ok. I already talked about precedence constraint I mentioned this uh, sensing happening somewhere computation happening somewhere else activation happening somewhere else basically precedence constraint connecting these activities. So, we have to worry about how this is done um, this mutual exclusion example would be the bus 
when I'm using the bus, nobody else should use it. When I'm using a chunk of memory which I'm updating, nobody else should read it. So those are examples of mutual exclusion. Time constraints we know. So scheduling is a job involved, job of planning the activities such that timing is kept. And on top of that, you have to have allocation. Allocation decides where the task should execute. Okay? So for example, there is a notion of firewalling in many critical applications. Uh, I mentioned this before, avionics processors or avionics processing is kept confined to a small number of highly uh, predictable processors which are run in replicated mode so that they are completely predictable. This is firewall from the rest of the system. You do not want a, a malfunctioning processor which controls the reading lights to affect the avionics system. Okay? So that is the allocation. You allocated the system tasks to processes in such a way certain criteria are met. Often if you allocate wrongly or sub-optimally, sub the amount of processing power might be much larger than required. But sometimes you pay the price because you know that things are predictable. Follow me? If you have le a leeway of allocating multiple tasks to the same processor, thereby reducing the number of processors or reducing the total processing capacity you should. There are ways of doing that. So for example, suppose there is a soft real time activity such as um, controlling this, the temperature in this room. How does it work? We look at the temperature, if the value is below 25 degrees, turn off the air conditioner. The value is above 35 degrees, turn on the air conditioner, otherwise do nothing. Which of these three possible paths, turn off, turn on, do nothing, do you think is going to happen more often? Do nothing. However, if I have to provide the resources for it in the worst case, I will take the worst case of on, off or do nothing, which will be one of on or off, turning on or off. If I design the system differently, whereby I just look at the temperature value, spawn another task to do the turning on or off, as opposed to turning on or off within this task. Like I call a servant task to say, you now do the work of turning on, you do, do the work of turning off. Then my job is very small. Okay? Not only that, I can allocate that aperiodic task to another processor completely, which is very close to the air conditioner. So these are ways by which you can come up with a design which allocates specific tasks to processes designed for that task as opposed to having a general purpose processor doing everything. So this is why embedded systems are slightly more complicated because you have to design processors which are specific to specific uh, sensors or actuators and there is not much point in putting all of the processing just because it involves the CPU into one single processor. Okay, this is what uh, I just mentioned. Temperature sensor takes an input, CPU processes it, output goes to a heater or air conditioner. Um, basically what I just told you, leave the temperature too high, turn off the heater, turn on the heater. We had, because this is for the, for a, for a place where there is heating required. We have enough heat around us, so cooling is what we need here. Okay. So generally speaking, there are lots of sensors, lots of heaters or air conditioners, a single computer controlling them. So what do we have to do? We have to schedule them by assigning priorities or some other way um, or do it in such a way that all the tasks will be done. So one easy way is sense this, sense this, sense this, sense this, and then do processing of all of them together and then send the command to the heater 1, heater 2, heater 3, heater 4. If you do that, then what we have is something like round robin. On the other hand, if one part of the room gets hotter much faster than other, people sitting next to that part will be feeling the change in temperatures much more than anybody else. So you don't want to do a round robin. There might be a notion of urgency attached to it. 
which is why we need something like priorities. So, these are typically interrupt driven systems that we have um, for mostly soft real time applications for example, for reasons we have seen before and the way these work is that these sensors have attached processors and they look at the temperature periodically in a very device specific way and when some setting is crossed then they send an interrupt to the device the, the central processor. So, when the interrupt comes you know that some action has to be taken you do not have to look at the value to see if the action has to be taken you know that when interrupt comes action has to be taken. So, this is like having a, a secretary in front of your office who will screen all incoming interrupts which otherwise it would be knocking on your door and if there is a knock on the door now you know that work has to be done ok. But this makes the system slightly harder to debug because interrupts can come on top of interrupts and so on uh, ok. Now, next is a set of slides which I am going to skip now, but I would like you to go through this these give different ways of programming the the sensor processing. So, as to achieve a required deadline of period of 100 milliseconds what I would like you to do is when we take a, a lunch break uh, or sometime in the afternoon they have free time go through these slides if you have any questions ask me tomorrow as to why we have to design these things very carefully ok let us do a stretch break <laughs>